First question is, what impact will China have on the U.S. or global economy? Also, the unemployment age for 18 to 25 in China is over 20 percent, creating an unpleasant environment. Yes. And um, my view has, is, is that the United States economy pretty much is independent of China and really the, the, the one mechanism that I see potentially feeding through into the U.S. economy is China's inflation. China may end up exporting deflation or disinflation, meaning that um, with weakness in China, the um, prices paid by the United States to China for their exports may soften. That's really the only transfer mechanism that I see. In other words, to the extent China is weak, I don't think it really affects U.S. economy. Our economy is really U.S. consumers. And U.S. consumers are in pretty good shape right now. Number two, will you discuss the cut in the U.S. credit rating? Fitch cut the U.S. credit rating to double A plus from triple A. And I think it was in 2011 that S&P did the same thing. So Fitch is the second rating agency to cut the U.S.'s credit rating. And uh, as far as I can tell, it really is pretty much of a non-event. Uh, everybody is aware of the budget deficits and uh, it hasn't seemed to matter uh, in terms of demand for U.S. bonds. And so it's just rating downgrade uh, to me is, uh, is really not, not, not a big deal. Slide 75, and yet we pay the large portion of the world security. Please don't call Europe more mature. Maybe I, the word to use is more realistic. My, my point was that if, if our societies want something, we have to pay for it. And the Europeans have decided that they will actually pay for, tax themselves to pay for social programs that they want. And here in the United States, we have not decided to tax ourselves to pay for the stuff that we actually want. And so at some point, Americans are going to have to become more realistic. And my term, my term was mature, <laughs> uh, but realistic may be a better descriptor. Do France and Germany have provincial and municipal taxes also? Yes, they do. And those are factored into that Slide 75, that comparison. BLS data from June to July shows roughly 500,000 full-time jobs lost versus 900,000 new part-time jobs created. Could this be a concerning trend? I hadn't studied that, so um, could this be a concerning trend moving forward? My view is the uh, employment. To the extent that we have many more job openings than we have unemployed people who are looking for jobs, which is this slide, then I think we're going to have a strong new job formation. And I'm not too concerned whether it's full-time or part-time. But I think this is one of the most important slides in the whole deck at the present time illustrating the strength of the U.S. economy and, and how I think that we're, we're going to continue to have comparatively strong new job formation. And that, I think, will keep us away from recession. Number seven, is there any consideration being given to moving away from manufacturing weighting in the LEI calculations? Uh, we were just talking about the index of leading economic indicators yesterday's release. And uh, in answer to this question, no, I don't think there is any consideration. I, I, I'm not the expert on the conference board, but I, I, I don't think that they uh, have uh, stated any intent to re reconstruct their LEI index. So the answer is no. Um, no, the, 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 I think it's fair to say, though, Fritz, they did move back once or twice, the date that the recession, the quarter the recession was supposed to begin. 
Yes. And they did in today's and yesterday's release say that on the other hand, if in their in their statement this month, and I think that's also kind of revealing. They were hedging just a little bit more than I've heard them before. But but yes. they they're sticking to their guns, it seems, right? Yes. Yes, but you make a good point. I, I noticed that too. It seems uh, I didn't compare the language uh, specifically compare it, but they were hedging and they were also talking about the CEI the, and uh, and also they they term they use the term a mild recession, which I don't think they had used before. So it sounds like they're hedging a little bit. Yes, Jeremy number eight. Jeremy Siegel recently wrote an in an update with Wisdom Tree that by using his measure of real-time housing data, current core CPI is running at one and a half percent. Do you think it could be this low? Well, I don't know what to think. I, I, uh, you know, I, I basically just accept our government statistics on inflation, and um, but I know that. Real-time housing data is suggesting a real slowdown, if not year-over-year -year negative comparisons on housing costs. So um, I, I think it's probably a, a, a good point that he's making, running at 1.5%, current core CPI at 1.5%. I just don't know. I, sorry, I can't give any illumination on that. Can you, number nine, can you explain the difference in the chart showing 7.9% historical earnings plus 2.1% dividends with a subsequent chart that shows a top end of 7% and a range of 6 to 7% earnings growth? Well, uh, the question is mixing apples and oranges. The 7.9% the historical figure that we're talking about is not earnings growth, it's stock prices. Uh, and I'll, I'll go to that chart just to illustrate what I'm talking about. So this is the, this is the chart we're talking about, 7.9% trend, trend line is the S&P 500 stock price index. Not, it's not earnings. And so I think the questioner was perhaps a little confused there. 7.9% stock price index versus the this chart is the other one he or she was referring to. Um, between 6 and 7% earnings growth. And also the uh, it's important to note that this chart goes back over 80 years and the previous chart is just back to 1991. So Two different measures, two different time periods. Hey, Fritz. Yes. Going back to question eight, by the way, um, where you, you know, the question about CPI running as low as 1.5. Yes. Um, I think, uh, and this may be apples and oranges too, but uh, you also showed that the, um, the current inflation rate, if you, annualize it comes yes. out to about two percent as i recall so which is not far off the 1.5 percent that's that's all yes. i'm saying but yes. but it was yes. i think it wasn't cpi it could have been pced on that one yes. which it, i don't know both, both of them actually uh and they both come out to two percent but uh an excellent point yes the current monthly run rate annualized comes out to two percent on both the cpi and the pced so yes, we're headed we're headed down, and uh, just reminds me that is pretty low. That that is really yeah yeah. You know. uh, number ten. What about businesses that need to refinance debt at now higher rates? Does he think this will negatively impact the economy? Um, yes, it would, and um, but. Yes, uh, many, many companies did debt financings at super low interest rates, but to the extent companies do need to refinance at higher rates, it will affect earnings. That's about all I can, that's about all I can say. I don't, you know, I don't, 
I don't know what effect that will have on the economy, to be honest, uh, but it will affect earnings for some companies. Number 11, do you have any comments about trueflation.com as a real-time indicator of inflation? Well, I wasn't familiar with trueflation.com until a half hour ago when I Googled it. And um, all I can say is that they they contend, they meaning trueflation.com, and I don't know who that is. I don't know what group they are or who it is that's doing the work, but it very well could be that they have a more accurate measure of real-time inflation than does the government. And uh, they, they contend that they're drawing um, from uh, all kinds of different data. I don't know what, what their statement was, but it was like a, a million data points or something like that. I, I, don't, I don't know exactly, but it could be that trueflation.com um, is a more accurate real-time measure of inflation. Uh, the problem from a policy standpoint is that policy isn't being made on trueflation.com numbers, it's being made on the PCED uh, principally. And so that's the reality of the situation. But trueflation, oh, trueflation I think also is showing two and a half percent inflation when I looked it up just a little while ago, and that's lower than the uh, 3% inflation that the official measures are showing. Number 12, where are things at the IRS on improving collections, which would offset the de deficit to some degree, right? Well, I don't have a lot of confidence in the IRS being able to significantly improve increase uh, revenue collection. So I don't think that we're going to see a material offset to the deficit um, coming from the IRS. Uh, number 13 is slide 34 updated for 2023. The horizontal axis goes through 922 only. I think it's actually slide 33 just trying because slide 34 doesn't have a horizontal axis going through 922. So let's look at slide 33. However, in the footnote to this slide, you can see that the quarter it's it's uh, the slide includes quarterly data through March of 2023. And this was released June 16th. And so the axis doesn't reflect the end uh, date. Anyway, it, uh, yeah, the most recent data. So anyway, this this is the most recently released data. Question number 14, slide 56. Is that bond yield chart on the 10-year bond? Yeah, that was from me. I wasn't sure if it was the 30-year or the 10-year. Probably the 10-year, though. It's, yeah, um, yeah, it's, it's a great question because the source of the data is Robert Schiller. And so I went back to Schiller's web page where I got this data and it is it's, the, the answer is the 10-year data 10-year Treasury bond data starts in 1953 in this chart and before 1953 I can't tell you exactly what debt instruments we used, but there there wasn't a I think I think there wasn't a 10-year Treasury bond before 1953, but there were other long dated government bonds. And so uh, he used, I, I'm not sure what he used going back to 1871 and he doesn't disclose that. Uh, but anyway, it was long dated bonds going back, way back in history. And then in 1953, it picks up with the 10 year treasury bond. So that's the answer to the question. Let's see, any, <clears throat> number 15, any comment on Russia's big interest rate hike? Again, I'm no expert on the Russian economy, but they they are trying to support the ruble, as, as from what I can tell, because uh, the ruble has been weak. And, um, but I would think that 
hikes in interest rates will make will, will be uh, constrictive on their economy, but they're trying to support their currency. That's about all I can say on Russia's big interest rate hike. It really is not relevant to the U.S. economy in any way that I can tell. Question 16, have European Central Bank rates decoupled from U.S. rates? Uh, again, uh, I don't know. Uh, I thought, I think most European Central Banks have been raising rates along with the United States, but not to the same degree. I, I think the, the um, their short-term interest rates are less than the United States, but have been moving up pretty much in tandem with U.S. rates. Question 17, Bill Gross doubled down on his negative view of stocks, but I also saw that a Wall Street firm gave up on its recession prediction this week. Are you seeing any signs of capitulation? <clears throat> yes, I am seeing signs of capitulation, meaning that, and, and I think I talked about this in, in the webinar, that um, many firms are coming around to, uh, with respect to the economy and economic forecasts coming around to the notion that we're not having a recession Many firms have been raising their estimates for GDP growth in the United States. Many firms have had to back away from their pessimistic views on stocks. And I cited Goldman Sachs raising their target for the S&P 500 from 4,000 to 4,500. Uh, so yes, there are signs of capitulation. As for Bill Gross, I don't, I don't listen to anything Bill Gross says. <laughs> <laughs> and, and particularly with respect to uh, the U.S. stock market, when the fact that he, Bill Gross has a negative view of stocks doesn't concern me one iota. Slide 32, you said immigration is down. Are you seeing any signs that immigration is loosening, loosening up for a lot of qualified job seekers into the country? Yes, I think that's the case. That's definitely the case. Um, I haven't talked about immigration specifically, but um, immigration, I think, in the last 12 months has really surged. And I don't know if these are qualified job seekers, but they are job seekers. And um, and we we need um, we need more workers. Legal immigration, right? Yes, but 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 you are seeing because Fareed Zakaria, I, I follow him. And he keeps saying, you know, this is going to be a problem that we don't have enough qualified people coming in. Yeah. It, you know, I, 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 I don't, that's not exactly what he's saying, but he's saying that the, um, the tightening on immigration that Trump did is continuing under Biden, which you're saying, no, that's not necessarily the case. You're, you're, you see evidence You've seen reports yeah. of, yeah, I'd love to see I, if you could send me some of that. I, I do, well, I, I, what I'll do is I'll just, I'll just make a note to, um, to clip any of those stories that I see, but I'm, I'm thinking of the Wall Street Journal reporting. Um, right, right. Yeah, to the extent that, you know, that um, we're, we're, we're seeing much more I think it's illegal immigration, <laughs> but uh, I think it's mostly, you know, at the at the southern border, many more people have been coming in in the last 12 months than were before. So, uh, question number 19, slide 34, while no one likes jargon, what is that term excess savings? Is that a new thing? This is the monetary base and the money supply. The The term excess savings is is a new term and I don't know that it has a precise definition other than that it is the term being applied to this bulge in the money supply and, and really the uh, cash that's sitting in household and business checking accounts as a result of the government's direct distribution of cash under the CARES Act and subsequent stimulus. So that's what's being referred to 
with the term excess savings, uh, savings that w would would not have been there but for the government distributions of cash. That's that's what excess savings is referring to. Twenty slide forty one. Isn't that observation that equal weighted is better for the long run kind of a big deal? Uh, and I'm glad you asked this question because it is definitely a big deal. And so let me just go to 41. Uh, and that's why I that's why I pulled the slide. I in in the course of any month I look through you know many many slides. And this one really caught my attention. The fact is that the equal weighted has outperformed the market cap weighted. And one of the major points that I've often made is that active management can't keep up with the S&P 500. Well, here's something that is consistently beating the S&P 500. It's called the equal weighted S&P 500. Wow, that's a big deal. The implication would be that um, investors would be best served by owning the equal weighted index, not the S&P 500. And, and, so, and, and the level of assets is probably like a fraction of the, the, the market cap weighted. If you look yeah. at, you know, the, the, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. That's, I think yeah, yeah. that sounds like it's kind of a yeah. revelation. I wonder yeah. if advisors are going yeah, to be interested in hearing from members, whether, you know, the A4A members are, changing anything in their portfolios as a result. It would be, it, it's, it's very definitely a big deal. I mean, a, a significant revelation, significant insight. So, okay, I think those are the questions. Uh, well, you, that's great. Thank you so much, Fritz. I'll try to get this posted over the weekend. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't do a great job with these questions because there's so many that I 